And then uh, Shauna Coons, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to be able to pronounce your tribe. I, you go ahead and do that. But Shauna is a uh, managing attorney at the Kiwi Quay law firm um, where she assists tribal uh, governments with real estate transactions, business and governance matters, and a variety of tribal and federal Indian law issues. Most recently, she secured a historic reservation proclamation that added over 2,000 acres to the La Corte. <laughs> yeah, I'll just totally butcher the name. I'm sorry. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> so I'll let you do that. Okay. Buju Ginawa, Shana Nindijnaka, Jaganashing Mong, Dashkejekwe Nindigo, Ojibwe Mong, Makwa Nindo Dame, Adawa Zaga Iginin, Jinakate, Shkonigan, Winjibayan. Good morning, everyone. Um, <laughs> glad you could make it here. Um, again, my name is Shana Coons. I'm an attorney at the Kwe Law Firm. Uh, Kwe is Ojibwe. I am from Lakutere. It's a tribe in Hayward, Wisconsin. And I recently created the Quay Law Firm. Uh, I'm a solo practitioner. I chose the name Quay. It comes from Ikwe, which means woman. Um, and I just felt like this was the name of the firm represented the strength of women and um, the leadership that we are bringing. Uh, there's a lot of excitement about Native women leaders in Minnesota uh, and nationally these days. And uh, I wanted to show my experience and offer my expertise and skills in that way. Um, and so that is where the name of the firm comes from. Um, I've been practicing in Indian law for over 10 years. Uh, like I mentioned, the law firm I've had for just about two months now. Uh, prior to that, I was at a boutique Indian law firm for about three years and then uh, Focus, there I was focusing on real estate, and tribal governance issues, some business issues. Um, before that, I was at a mid-sized law firm that had an Indian law section doing other transactional business law work uh, focused towards tribal governments. Um, and I have worked as in-house attorney for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. Did that for about four and a half years, working with their community development and housing department, and then also as an in-house attorney, um, did a lot of child protection, some criminal prosecution, and kind of, as in tribal government, whatever comes your way and, and walks in your door, uh, I had the opportunity to work on that. Um, I got my start after law school uh, clerking in Hennepin County, uh, down in Minneapolis for a judge there. Um, I was uh, with Judge Robert Blazer. He was uh, one of the first American Indian judges in Minnesota, and he was the... Um, clerk, or not clerk, he was the um, chief judge of the civil division um, and then also had a criminal block. And so when I was in the courts, I was able to kind of see the courtroom side of um, some major crimes and then also some you know, major summary judgment and business transactions um, that ended up fighting things out in litigation. Um, I am a uh, Minnesota girl. I was raised here in Minnesota, went to U of M law school and or, I'm sorry, I went to the U of M undergrad, um, got my degree in sociology, American Indian studies, and uh, went to William Mitchell College of Law right in St. Paul. So um, have kind of stayed local, really like the area here. Uh, how many people do we have here from Midwest? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, so we have a few. Um, anyone from California? Oh, we got some travelers here. I'm sorry, the weather's not good today. It's going to be warmer tomorrow. Um, anyone from down south, uh, Texas, New Mexico? Okay, some more people who are probably not happy with the cold weather today. Um, well, good. So, again, like it was mentioned, there, this was supposed to be a tax session, and uh, the presenter had some, some things come up and was not able to make it, and so um, I've offered to step in and help out. Um, this is a session I've never presented on this specific topic, but on these ideas I have. So this is a new presentation for you guys. Um, how many people here have worked on uh, commercial real estate transactions in Indian country before? A couple. Okay, good. So some of this is going to be um, more overview. 
Uh, this is a large topic. We could certainly do a whole day or multiple days digging into the specific nuances of commercial real estate issues. Um, but I'm going to try and still keep some of this um, more overview high level so that uh, you get an idea of what some of the issues are to look for, how to maybe approach and organize a transaction um, so that when you do find yourself faced with the commercial real estate deal, you might have a little more, um, a little more of an idea of how to kind of organize and get through that. Um, or maybe you'll find some tips that you can apply to some of the uh, maybe leasing or housing or, or other um, issues that you're facing in your, your day. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, ask questions throughout. Um, and then uh, I'm going to go through the presentation. And when we're done, I do have, uh, if we have time, I do have some checklists that I can pull up. Uh, it's difficult to put a full checklist in the presentation because sometimes they can be three or four pages long. So where appropriate, I did take snippets, and we will talk about those checklists. So um, this is an overview of some of the things we're going to go through today. Some of the basic deadlines or the basic, basics in a transaction, uh, how to track some of the deadlines, uh, some key issues with due diligence, um, title commitment, uh, key terms in some of the, per the transaction documents, and then some closing checklists. So, you know, one of the really important things, it sounds very basic, but is to really know the structure of your transaction and who the parties are. If you're working with a bank, they're going to be um, sticklers or anyone who's going to be financing this project or government funding, they're going to be sticklers for the details. They're going to want to make sure, are you working with the tribe specific and do you have the federally recognized name of the tribe? Is that in there correct? I know oftentimes when we're dealing with our tribes, um, we tend to shorten the name and just do with what, say, refer to them as what's comfortable. Um, you know, for instance, I say I'm from Lacoudre. It's actually the Lacoudre Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians. It's kind of long, but <laughs> of Wisconsin, yeah. <laughs> um, so you need to make sure you get the full names in there. And if you're dealing with departments, um, find out what type of authority those departments are going to have and make sure you understand that uh, from the seller and the buyer's perspective. Maybe you're dealing with an outside entity and is it a parent company or a, a subdivision or are there two parties that are involved? So you really need to know the role of the parties. Um, we were recently working on a transaction where we had a seller who owned the, the real estate and the property and then they had uh, a manager that was involved, but the manager had created another separate entity that owned some of the equipment. And so as we're going through our diligence, we realized, okay, well, we really need to identify that both of these entities are gonna be sellers that have assets they're selling to us in this project. So we wanted to make sure we got that covered and that we were gonna be obtaining everything in this deal and we had the right parties listed. Um, one thing you can do to help the, the parties you're representing or the tribes you're representing is um, see how much information you can get about transaction costs um, and even uh, management costs for uh, once the transaction's closed. Uh, this will help your tribal entities and departments with their budgeting and help them prepare. Um, if you're lucky enough, you can maybe get a a monthly spreadsheet, um, lost profit statements from the selling entity to you know, really help and look and see where is their money going and how much does it cost to manage these things. And when I talk about commercial transactions, I'm um, generally referencing uh, something more than just the land purchase. Um, I know a lot of people work on land deals where they're buying raw land um, or you know, working with land leases, but for me, when I think of a commercial transaction, I think of you know buying the land, and then is there a business that's coming with it? Um, maybe you're buying the the gas station down the street, and so not only are you acquiring the land, but you want to purchase that business and operate that business. Um, there might be some really good will with that business that you want to keep, 
and so do you want the business name? So when I'm referring to commercial transactions, I'm thinking more about, okay, not only do we want the land, but we want whatever the, the business is there, whatever its physical assets are, and electronic uh, intellectual property as well. So as you're getting to know your, your transaction, your structure, um, I've found it's really helpful to, to chart it out. Um, I mentioned we were working on a transaction where uh, with, we're working with the seller and then we discovered that there was another entity. So in that situation, um, this is kind of the, the structure of what it looked like. Um, Silverleaf was the selling entity. Uh, what they were selling was a, a golf club and uh, what was included with that was golf memberships, software, you know, obviously the 18-hole the golf course, um, but there's some intellectual property too, um, logos, uh, websites. Uh, but as we were working into this, we discovered, well, there is also golf cart leases, and those were under a separate management company. And there was some of the heavy equipment that was used to manage the property that was owned by the separate entity. So we had to um, modify our documents to make sure we included both of those people as sellers so that we took proper title to all the assets that were necessary to operate the golf course. So as you're getting to know your transaction, it's also really helpful to create a contact list to know who all the parties are. Um, so here I've created a, a fake contact list for a fake transaction, um, made my law firm a tribe, and uh, you might recognize some of the names. I've borrowed from NTLA for people to be representatives here. So in a, a typical contact list, I would put down at the top who are the decision makers, the people with authority. With the tribal government, I would often list um, all the tribal leaders that would be involved, whether it's a reservation business council with five members, and put their roles, if they're chairman, secretary, treasurer. Um, if, they have, if there's any key roles that they're going to play or requests that they have, um, I found it's helpful to keep this on my internal contact list. So I've put some examples in there. Um, for instance, if you're ever contacting the chairwoman, um, include the attorney in all the communications. Um, how many attorneys do we have in the room? Okay, a, a couple. Um, so for attorneys, we know it's, it's very, you always want to be very careful when speaking with other parties and making sure that um, you're keeping the attorney in there, the other attorney involved, and you're not going to violate any attorney-client privilege. Um, so as lawyers to the non-lawyers in the room, um, sometimes we're very careful when speaking with outside parties um, to make sure that we may only go through the attorney um, or that the other attorney is always involved in the communication because uh, we don't want to get caught in a position where we've maybe been um, speaking to another party without uh, proper consent. Um, so those are good notes to make here. Uh, sometimes you'll have part, or transactions where they want to keep everyone involved and you'll have a, a very long email list. Um, so you might want to make uh, an email uh, group list that has ever, all the necessary people included. Um, but those are details that's really good to keep on a, a contact list um, so you know who are the right people to communicate with. Um, also identifying who are their assistants because um, if you're not able to reach someone and, and you know sometimes you've got deadlines that are coming up and you need to get some information or some answers um, that day and if you can't get through to them it, it's good to know who the assistants are um, so that's for even for the, the attorneys I put the lead attorneys down um, Sarah Lawson of counsel she was the going to be the tax presenter so now she gets to be the attorney in my fake deal um, and then uh, Kate Cake was going to be my co-presenter and um, so that's how he made it into a legal attorney up there. And then uh, when you bail out, then your dog, the pug, gets to be your legal assistant. Um, other parties I look to include is 
you know, is there a title company that we're going to be communicating with closely? It's really good to have all their contact information on the one sheet. Um, are there surveyors that are involved? Are we working with the state historic preservation officer? Are there other state departments and agencies? Um, it's, it's just, it's really useful to have all this information on one list that you or your assistant can manage. And then internally, you can also provide that if you're gonna be going to a meeting um, where all the parties are together and maybe the, the chairwoman or chairman wants to know who's involved, well, you've got this list all handy. You can pull it out and say, here's the people that will be at the meeting and their roles. Um, so it just really helps you keep you organized. Another thing is to be very mindful of what type of timing constraints you're going to be working with on your project. Uh, as soon as you can, start calendaring and scheduling dates and take a look at your calendar. Take a look at the, the tribe's calendar. See what do you know that's going on? Do you see any concerns or issues that might come up? Um, so, uh, you know, take a look at dates. I, I know we always look, we were picking a closing date and, you know, always try and pick an actual day of the week that people work because um, you don't want to run into issues with, well, I, we selected a closing date that's a Sunday and notices are due three days before, but, you know, well, when are we actually closing? Are we going to close on the Monday? Are we going to close on the Friday? And then how do we calculate our, if we have notices that are due, you know, X number of days before, how do we calculate that out? Um, so, you know, just be sure and mindful to, to verify your dates with calendars that they're going to work. Um, you know, don't select February 31st if it's not, you know, you're not going to be in a leap year or you're not going to have 31 days. So, um, so be mindful of that. And then as you're going through review, if you already have a purchase agreement, look through that for your key dates. When is the closing date? When are due diligence dates? Um, are there any um, preliminary title dates um, or other notices, opportunity to cure, um, option to terminate? Find out, calculate when those dates are, get them calendared, and maybe look at creating a separate um, calendar list to keep track of your deadlines. Uh, and don't be afraid to reach out to the other parties to make sure that you both agree on the dates you're looking at. Um, that can come down to an interpretation issue and you don't want to run into a problem where you, know, where you have to submit objection notices by a certain date. Did you calculate or count your days wrong and then suddenly you've missed that deadline? Um, so those are things that can be kind of uh, remediated early on. Um, and by reaching out, you're building a good relationship between all the parties involved. So if there are issues, it's hopefully easier to work them out later on. Um, other things to consider are um, whether there's any seasonal issues. Do you need to um, get out and do a lot of due diligence before possibly the ground freezes or there's snow on the ground? Um, is there a, a rainy season that you need to take into consideration and try and push and, and get things through before then. Um, and then are there any major government dates that could be um, impacting? Uh, we were working on a, a big transaction this winter and um, trying to get some approvals from the BIA and then there was a federal shutdown. And um, so we ended up having to push our transaction out a few months to wait for the government to start up and then wait for everyone to kind of recover and get back in and, and pick up um, the work that they had missed while they were out. Um, so you know, try and be mindful of what else might be happening that could impact your dates. Uh, so this is a transaction deadline schedule uh, that I make. Uh, so what I do is I'll just do a, a Microsoft Word chart or an Excel chart, put down the date, um, identify items, so whether it's the purchase agreement, the opening with the escrow, when the preliminary title report is due, um, then you can identify uh, the responsible party, who is it the seller that needs to bring it, deliver it, is it the buyer, um, and you can get even more specific, is it the buyer, um, 
legal department who's going to be drafting and doing the first draft? Um, is it the title company that's um, sending something off? Um, or is, are you waiting for seller to review? Um, so, you know, identify what you can. Um, another thing you could consider is putting in a column for um, other notes. Um, so if you have to, you know, maybe you wanted to discuss uh, something that came up, an easement that came up in the preliminary title report. Um, so maybe you want to have a column of notes to say, oh, discuss easement with realty department so you know whether or not you're going to be objecting to that later on. And then identify where it's at in the process. Um, has that already been completed? You can identify who completed it. Um, you know, even reference, if depending on how complicated and how detail-oriented you want to be, reference, you know, email to Jane Doe on January 5th at 4 p.m., you know, email and file. Um, it just, it's a good way to keep yourself organized and to track things so that when questions come up, you can find the information you need. So again, and this is just the first part, you know, investigation period closes is what we have at the bottom. You'll want to, you know, continue on with your closing deadlines, post-closing, and then any notices that are required to go before those um, termination deadlines um, and notices or and cured notice periods. So along with your timing considerations, uh, as you're looking at when things are due, now you need to think about the activities and the actions. How much time do you need to order and make these requests? Um, you know, if you're working for a tribe, they might have a procurement policy in place. Does it require you to get bids? And how long is that going to take? Do you have to post notice for um, certain procurement opportunities? So make sure you keep those time frames in mind um, when you're looking at your deadlines. And if you do have um, tribal codes or tribal policies that dictate when things are going to happen, that could be a negotiating point too. If you want more time to do some diligence and maybe you need to have um, a survey done and you have to post this, um, take bids, uh, that could be information to identify to the um, other party. Say, hey, we're, we, have to, we want to work within our laws and our codes and this is what it says, so we need this additional time. Um, so that can be a, another beneficial negotiating tool for you as well. But, um, you know, build in enough time to, to um, make sure you can accomplish all the tasks that you need, get the um, work ordered that you need, and then you might want to add in an extra day or two and give yourself a calendar notification so that you know these dates are coming up. Is there... Um, you know, is there inspections that are due on a certain day? Do you want to follow up with the um, property manager for your client to see, do you have this inspection set and scheduled to make sure that they're staying on track too? Um, and then also uh, scheduling, when are these reports going to be coming? Okay, so the inspector came out and he looked at it and, and maybe the inspector said, um, he or she will have a report due in two weeks. So, you know, put that on your calendar so you can follow up with them and make sure you get that um, because that could be some valuable information and you want to keep your project on time moving through the schedule. So another key piece is just having a really good understanding of the property that's involved, um, both the real property and the personal property and whether you're looking at um, whether the sellers own the property or whether they have um, leases that they're going to be transferring to you. So make sure you have a really good understanding of where the property is, what the size is, you know, get as much detail as you can. Um, actually go out and inspect the property. Um, does your seller, are they in possession? And if not, they might not have good information about what the condition of the property is, what the buildings look like, maybe what's on the land. Um, so 
actually physically inspecting and viewing the property can help give you a lot of good information too. Um, and also let you know what's going on in the neighboring area. Um, is there other neighbors, um, real estate issues next door that could be impacting you? And then make sure you talk with your client and find out what is the properly, property currently being used for and how is that working? And what is your client looking to do with that property? Um, is, is this going to work and meet their expectations? Um, are they looking to buy a, um, you know, perhaps they're buying a propane company where there is propane storage and they're thinking, oh, well, we can also use this and convert it into a gas station. Have them look at the property and see, is it going to work? Is there enough space? Um, are there environmental issues? Uh, so, you know, start thinking globally and get to know your transaction. And then also, you know, manage the expectations during the transaction. How is the seller going to be treating that property? So you don't want to find yourself in a situation like us where we receive this photo. We're buying this land and suddenly there's cranes out there and what, what are they doing? Why are they excavating and digging? Is this part of their normal business um, or is this an issue? Um, we looked back at our purchase agreement and they were allowed to do um, manage the property in their ordinary course of business and we questioned, okay, this doesn't look like ordinary course of business for this land here. Um, but they said they had excess black dirt and they sell the black dirt and um, we asked for details about that. What's the price? How much is being moved? Um, where is it coming from? Um, so gather the information, um, but manage the expectations that is something like this going to be okay? Or during your interim, do they need to, do the parties need to consult? Um, is the seller required to obtain consent from the buyer to do something like this? Um, is it just that they're required to provide notice if they're going to be making any material changes to their business? Um, what would be within the normal and ordinary course of business? So as you're drafting your documents, keep those things into consideration and put them in your agreements. Um, or if you run into something, maybe you need an addendum. If you already have your agreement signed, maybe you need to do an addendum or an amendment that clearly explains what is authorized and what's not authorized. Um, same could be for you know, contracts. Um, do they have, uh, are they selling goods and widgets and do they need to maintain a certain uh, level of inventory? Do you want them to reduce the inventory because you're going to be bringing in a different type? Um, or do you want them to increase because you're looking to expand? So um, those are terms that you might want to consider um, and uh, just to help manage everyone's expectations. So once you have your purchase agreements put together, then you're going to go into your due diligence phase where you're going to really dig in and start getting information. Um, a good way to manage this is to create a due diligence request list. And so that's going to be a list where you're going to ask for, um, break it down by topics to get into all the areas and all the information you need. Uh, a good way to organize these is, you know, this might sound kind of basic, but if you can number them, you know, here's your um, Article 1 is going to be title documents, Article 2, corporate documents, Article 3, leases and contracts. And then within there, maybe item number 1 of title documents is you want copies of the deeds. T number 2 would be um, copies of easements, um, preliminary title report. Maybe for corporate documents, you need to see their articles of the corporation and bylaws um, or resolutions. So identify specific documents, but then also include in your due diligence request any physical inspections that you may want. So um, for instance, under physical condition and environmental issues, you know, maybe that's Article 5, uh, 
number one is going to be uh, buyer wants the right to come do an environmental inspection or a phase one. Uh, maybe buyer wants the right to have a building inspector come out and look at the property. Um, so include those in your list. Uh, and then if there's any business expenses or business due diligence that you're going to be doing, identify those specific too. That do you want copies of um, loss and profit statements? Um, do you want copies of their budgets? Uh, do you want copies of their employment policies? Um, so that you've got it all clearly identified and numbered. So when they're responding, hopefully you'll have a good seller who will follow your schedule and make it easier for you to organize your information. Um, and again, then if there's questions come up as you're presenting to your tribal council or department, you can um, e more easily find that information when someone asks about, well, you know, well, what happened with that um, irrigation system? Oh, well, we got information on that in our diligence. Or, or what were those property tax statements? Oh, that was in the financials in our diligent respons diligence responses. So then, after you've organized your due diligence request list, um, make a due diligence checklist. Go back through your purchase agreement to see what are the deliverables that are required in the purchase agreement, um, what are the areas and the contingencies that have to be met, and can those be met by specific documents um, and information, and, and chart that in uh, another checklist. So um, here's a sample of one for a title investigation. We've got, um, we needed a, a, a preliminary title report um, and then just notes that you know, a revised draft was received, which parties were involved with that, um, dates it was received, uh, UCC searches. Is someone gonna be checking to see whether there's any um, liens that have been filed against equipment uh, and who's going to be doing those searches. You can include dates, um, surveys, architectural plans. Uh, some of these things, maybe they have files of, of large schematics for architect plans um, where it's not something, you know, old documents that weren't scanned in or um, maybe not easily to transfer. Um, you might have to go on site and inspect those. Um, uniform commercial code, okay, that's what I yeah. So uh, uniform commercial code has to do with the sale of goods. Mm -hmm. um, there's similar to how with real estate, you've got property recording um, in in county recording offices. Um, you can do liens like you would on a, on a car. Um, you can also do it on um, commercial and other property and file them. The state, usually Secretary of State, uh, will have a, a way to file. UCC liens, then what you can find out, oh, well, you know, this, this uh, um, gravel company that my tribe is going to buy uh, came with some excavators, and we want to buy the excavators. Well, it'll be important to do your UCC search to find out, oh, did the company, the seller, get a mortgage or get a loan on those and put a lien on the excavators where, you know, Bank ABC already has a lien, so that lien's going to have to be satisfied if you want to take title to those excavators that you think are coming in your deal. So those are, and those things can come up. It's going to be um, smart to look for those things, smart to track it so that you know, do you need to do with anything later with that, or have those issues been satisfied? Um, and then I also included the business investigation. Because um, you want to make sure that when you're getting your transaction, um, that it's going to be a valid transaction. Uh, make sure that your corporate entity that you're dealing with is still in good standing and has authority to um, consent to the sale. Uh, if you're, you know, are you dealing with an entity that maybe has some internal fighting and, and are there vacant seats on a board? Do they have enough members? And have those members been granted authority to sign the deeds or the bill of sale? Um, so it is appropriate to ask for information on the seller's corporate entity. And uh, you should do so to protect 
your client and your tribe. Um, one big thing we found in one of our projects was uh, contracts. Some companies are smaller and they may not have a lot of written documents and they may not do a lot of written contracts, but um, are those coming with on your, your agreement um, and your purchase? Are you buying that, uh, that, that gas station store where they have contracts in place for someone to come and maybe do the linen, the linen cleanings um, and shampoo the rugs uh, do they have a contract for someone to do snow removal or landscaping? Do you want to keep those contracts in place? So you want to ask for all the contracts so you can take a look at them, see what the terms are, and decide whether those come with the deal or whether to take them out. But track that information here. And then, you know, just go through your transaction documents, your purchase agreements, to see what is the information that's included, and that's how you create your due diligence checklist. Another big piece that will drive your transaction is financing. If you're dealing with uh, a bank loan or maybe some federal or state grant or other um, tribal grant program that might have requirements, uh, communicate with those people. They will be able to, um, they might want to look at draft documents. They might want to see all of this due diligence information that you have. They might want to comment and um, request specific pieces themselves. So. Um, Take a look at your financing terms and what do those require and make sure you're meeting those expectations as well. And again, as we were mentioning UCC sales, are you going to be financing equipment where you need to verify that information as well? Um, and is your lender, uh, is their counsel able to help and, and look in anything? Um, you might have another party that you can rely on for negotiating power with the seller or um, maybe there's terms that, when, you know, if the seller is saying, well, hey, can we have more time? And do you have a grant that you have to spend? And so you can say, well, we're using this grant money. We have to do it by this deadline. So I'm sorry, seller, we can't give you an extension. Um, otherwise, the deal won't go. So a couple different things to think about when you're looking at um, some of those financing issues and, and just what's included in your deal. And then along financing, what is the tribe's uh, position on financial implications? Is this something where are you going to be mortgaging property? Uh, and do you need to bring this to tribal council and get a unanimous consent? Do you need to do a referendum vote of the entire membership to authorize a financing? Are you going to be pledging assets as security? So in the event there's a default on financing, is the lender able to come in and take those assets, such as you know that excavator? Are they able to come in and take that property? Um, and is that considered a pledge under your tribal code that you need to present to the membership for approval? Um, so take a look at those. Uh, also, how does your tribe look at, at foreclosure and recourse um, in default. Are those something that, would you need a, a waiver of sovereign immunity to have those? Would there be a choice of law? Is this something that's gonna happen in tribal court um, or state or federal court? You know, what is the tribe's position on these types of issues and how does that work in this deal? Some other federal Indian law issues to think about is, you know, what's the tribe's purpose with this property? Are they going to be transferring it into trust later on? Uh, if so, you might want to consider, um, look for other issues in that project. Uh, one thing that I've run into on a couple different deals recently is the Anti-Deficiency Act. Is anyone running into that with the BIA? We got one. Um, so couple different projects. We had recently 
where um, we were doing a land transfer of raw land from a state agency to a tribe. And this land was open for parks and um, recreational use, you know, still wanted community to people in the state to come in and be able to enjoy the outdoor wilderness and recreational space. So this agency that we were working with wanted to put a lien on the property that said um, the two parties will jointly manage it for outdoor recreational space. It's like, okay, well, that sounds great. Everyone, that's what the tribe wanted to do too, is keep it open. But the minute we file that in the county recording office, that's going to show up on the title commitments. And when we go to transfer into trust, the BIA is going to say, wait a second, we, don't, we can't jointly manage this. What's that going to cost to jointly manage this property in such a way? So they point to the Anti-Deficiency Act, which says um, they need an appropriation for funding in order to agree to a contract. So if they don't already have an agreement for that funding in place, then they can't take on this additional obligation. And they'll point to that very quickly and say, oh, this is a violation of the Anti-Deficiency Act. Sorry, you have to remove this from title. So that's a good thing to watch for um, when you're working on your deeds to make sure that you don't enter into any agreements um, that are going to mess up a fee to trust application later. No, so that's exactly the point. The, yeah, they'll they'll flag it. They'll catch it. They'll flag it. No, and they'll send it back and they'll say um, this needs to be removed. Um, um, so, in this specific one I was just talking about, we were still working out the deal. It hadn't been recorded yet, um, but there have been other situations where you know. Nita and I uh, have worked on a project that had to deal with a driveway where there was just a simple driveway agreement that the parties were going to maintain it. And well, up in the Midwest, that means removing snow, which is going to cost money. So we had to spend a long time trying to get that taken off of an old deed. It was just one sentence, the parties will jointly maintain. And it held up a fee to trust. And so we had to get everyone to um, we were eventually able to get everyone to agree to release this driveway, and everyone got their own individual driveway um, so that our, on our fee to trust application, there was no maintenance management language on title that would trigger the BIA and the Anti Deficiency Act. Um, so, hopefully, you can catch these things before someone tries to record it. Um, and then, if you do, try and negotiate for a side agreement and identify to them the reasons why that, hey, this is gonna prevent us from going into feed trust or just as simple as like, hey, this is not allowed under federal law. We wanna put the property into to trust with the US and federal law will not allow this language to happen. Um, so again, kind of leaning on those other statutes and those other agencies to help, help you negotiate. And then you go to, can you get a side agreement where it's just between the two parties? And you're not going to record it. Um, it'll just be contract rights where you're both agreeing to each other. Um, and in those situations, we just really push that this is a government to, you know, a government relationship. Tribes want to be good neighbors and good stewards. They want to uphold their obligations. Um, so, so trust us. Um, and we always try to say, no, we don't waive sovereign immunity for these. We are a government-to-government -government relationship. Um, you have to act on faith with the tribe as a good neighbor. Just another situation where we've encountered that doesn't relate to any agreements to maintain or operate land, but rather this being a relatively rural area for a long time, there are a variety of easements that may exist on parcels of land that the tribe has. Acquired, and so the federal position has been: you need to remove that before we'll take it into trust. Whether it operates today or not, it needs to go away because there's a chance it might. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a uh, a good point. That anything from even prior old rural land that might have been recorded from from long time ago that 
um, the federal government will say, no, this needs to come off before it can go into trust. Um, we ran into some of that with, uh, with a project and the title company, some title companies in some states, um, if there is a, you know, for instance, in Minnesota, there's a, a 40 year period um, where the title company can go back 40 years, anything older than that is going to fall off title. They say it's, there's Minnesota statutes that um, just cure those issues. If it's 40 years old, it, it's, it's too old uh, for the claim to come up. Some title companies will go back further, and that is a good idea. Um, but we came into an issue where we had a title company um, that included on the deed, uh, on the title commitment, deeds from 1905 that identified um, flowage rights and the rights for logs to flow down the river, um, which was standard language at that time when they were doing a lot of logging up in this, this area. But we looked at the deed and we looked at the land. There was never any water on this land, never any possibility of a river or a stream. Um, so we had to bring that up to the title company because we knew that was going to be a problem with the BIA. And we said, hey, you know, you guys are familiar with this area. You're familiar with this land. There, there's no rivers or streams. And they said, oh, yes, yes, sorry. OK, we'll take that off. So that was an easy fix, um, but things to be mindful of. Um, so watch out for those, those issues and put them in side agreements if you can. Um, so again, during your due diligence, uh, you want to make sure you have access to the property. Um, access to all the records and information that you need, and maybe that's going to sit down and go through business records on computers um, in their office. Uh, maybe it's going through files, uh, but maybe it's just putting on your boots and walking the land and um, bringing out a building inspector who's going to look at the, the mechanics, look at the, the heating, heating systems, the cooling systems, the, the plumbing systems to make sure everything's okay. How does the foundation look? Um, what's your uh, intended use? Are they going to keep the structure? Are they going to improve the structure? And can that structure support additional improvements? Um, so be sure to um, request access that's going to allow you to get all the information you need. Um, and be sure to allow to have your um, consultants and contractors uh, the right to access that property. Um, it's most often it's going to be at reasonable times during a business day, uh, and they might request that they be given some notice before you access the property, um, but just make sure that you have those pieces in there. And then as you're discovering all this information and finding either issues, um, things to be followed up on, concerns about property, or maybe you're finding um, positive things to highlight and you want to notify them, hey, did you guys think about this, this separate area for where you could develop something there? Um, Start uh, accumulating that information and drafting memos. Find out if that's what your client wants and maybe prepare memos to explain um, high level. These are some of the things that we found that someone needs to look into or we need to be aware of. Um, and maybe it'll lead you to consulting with your insurance company about future coverage or um, appraisers, feasibility studies. Um, but you know, start gathering your information in a memo to keep yourself organized. Uh, and then, just as an attorney, you will then have that record of information, present that memo to your client. Then you've got your record that you've done the diligence, you've advised them, put your recommendations in there, um, and document. What did they decide? How do they want to? Do they want to move forward with the project, or do they want to terminate based on what they found? Um, did you advise them that there's structural considerations? And then did they bring in a building inspector that confirmed that? You know, verify that you've gathered that information, the client has been informed, um, and that, so that they're making informed decisions. So you have a much better idea about your project now. So now go back and look at your title again. 
because it might make a whole more sense now that you have an idea of what's going on, what's happened with that property, and um, what's going to be happening in the what your client wants to do with it. Um, you might have a better understanding of things to look for now. Um, I know because when you start, if one of the first things you get is the title commitment, you might read through that and you know won't jump out at you. Maybe that there's utility easements that that wouldn't um, strike you as anything obvious. But maybe when you get out there and you see, well, is there a lot more utilities than were referenced? Or are they not where they um, indicated in the title reports? Um, or are, you know, the, once you have started looking this over, once you jump in again, um, you'll be able to identify some additional issues that could be of great value um, to your client and the tribe and that can really help out in the project. Um, also look to see are there any marketability issues? Um, is there anything impacting that land that would prevent uh, future sales or future leases on that land? Things that you've maybe now discovered through um, doing your due diligence, doing your surveys. Is your access everywhere as identified or do you need to um, think about other other issues um, we had a project where on the plat there was a road that went all the way around it and so that looked great we had access well and then we found um, some more survey work that was done and at a later many years later and when we put held them up together we looked we said oh well where this plat approved a road there's actually a wetland right there. So we're gonna have to think about that. Do we really, now we don't have access to the back part of the development. Um, and can we purchase additional land to go around the wetland? Can we purchase wetland credits so we could fill in the wetland? Um, but you know, important things to think about that you know, it didn't seem like an issue when we first looked at the title, but as we got more documents and put them together, we were able to catch more things. Um, same thing for your survey. Take a look at that again. Um, does your project require any survey work? Are you um, subdividing your land where you need to have uh, a new survey done and you're gonna be working with the county? Um, find out what your timing constraints are with the county and what they require. Is it just one lot that's being split into two and it can be just done informally? Um, or are they gonna require um, a survey appearance before, um, a committee, a land committee, uh, approval by a zoning board, approval by the county board? And how long is that gonna take? Um, so you know, make sure you're looking at those documents and figure out what you're gonna do. And do you need a new legal description? Um, for some of your documents, your closing documents. Do you need new property IDs? Um, and do you have to work with the county to get that information? So, you know, again, it just helps to, once you've gathered some information and jumped in, go back to the beginning, start over, because things will look a lot different. So with these commercial agreements, um, look to see, are there any other leases or contracts that are gonna be coming with this project. Uh, look those over for their basic terms. Is everything in there the information that you need? Do you have the names, locations? Do you know um, what the, the rents and payments are? Is there um, any uh, interest or late fees or that? What are those terms in those agreements and how do they work with your client? Um, are, they, are you going to be able to uphold those? And are there any unusual terms? Did the seller agree that in two years they're going to um, put a new rough on, roof on the structure? Um, and if you're going to take on that agreement, are you going to be able to do that? Are you going to be able to meet that expectation? Or do you need to go back once you take this property and this lease, do you have to go back and try and amend that or come up in agreement with this person? Um, are those contracts and agreements even assignable? Some of them might be written so that they're personal to those specific entities and they can't be transferred. 
So what's going to happen in those situations? Uh, you might have to go back and, and negotiate that, yes, they agree, these leases or these contracts can be assigned to the new buyer. So just look for any of those covenants. Um, are there any warranties that are related to the property that you might want to also look at getting information on and seeing if those transfer? So after you've gone through and identified all the property and equipment, um, look at, you might be at a point now where you're going to be crafting a asset purchase agreement or, um, you know, other type of a, a term agreement for the individual property and equipment. So if you don't already have one of those in place, make sure someone starts drafting it or um, pull that out and take a look at it, see if it doesn't need to be revised. Uh, make sure it clearly identifies all the property and equipment. Again, are you um, buying a golf course and you want all those golf carts? Are you buying that, um, that mining lot and you want to have all those excavation equipment? Um, are you buying that, that grocery store and do they have a delivery truck that you want to have come with it? Um, make sure that those, those items are in there. Um, so then as you're drafting this, some of the key terms to look at are making sure that you um, identify any of the liens or encumbrances that are known and would be permitted. So have some language in there that says, um, after you're doing your UCC search, if you find some of these liens, um, that they will be accepted or what is not acceptable um, and so have some language in your agreement about that. Uh, look back also at your original purchase document because that may have some language that will carry over into your asset purchase agreement. Other representations and warranties where the seller says that they'll provide clear title to all property and equipment. So maybe it's already covered in your purchase agreement and you don't need it in your, per in your asset purchase agreement. Um, also, um, is there anything specific to the state you're in? Um, is there a covenant that the seller will comply with all laws, um, which can cover zoning permits and other real estate issues? Um, so some of these terms may already be in your purchase agreement, but otherwise you might have to put some of these things in your asset purchase agreement or other documents and um, or amend them after you're doing your due diligence. So other key representations to be in your documents um, is that you want to make sure you've got good, good marketable title and that there's no liens and encumbrances. That should be um, a key term that's somewhere in one of these documents. Um, also that, you know, the seller isn't granting anyone else any property rights um, and that there's no other rights to purchase, rights of first refusal that would be complicating your project. Um, you want to make sure that the seller agrees that all the agreements are valid and enforceable um, and that none, no one's in default or in breach on any of those agreements. If they are, um, that could be something that you require them to cure before moving forward on the project. Um, and then make sure that the seller hasn't assigned or um, given any interest in any of the property or lease agreements. Um, you can include a covenant somewhere in your purchase documents that uh, a representation that all the owned and leased property um, and equipment in the agreement represents all the property that the seller has related to that business. So kind of some, what are some catch-all language that really says everything that the seller has to, um, to, to run their chair manufacturing store is coming to you when you buy that chair manufacturing store. Um, that can help if there are things that are off-site, um, just make sure that all the equipment is included. Um, and then also 
uh, consider what are some of the, the key issues and covenants that are going to be specific for this project. Um, you know, do you want them to maintain the property in the same condition, um, subject to ordinary wear and tear? Did you want them to do specific improvements um, or maybe avoid doing specific improvements? Were they, were they considering, um, you know, building uh, another um, storage facility addition to their property? And you said, no, well, we don't want them to do that. Please stop on that project while we're in this interim phase. So consider that with your covenants. What, what can and, and should they not be doing? Um, and then if there is any obligations to make repairs, if you did that inspection, you saw that, well, there was, you know, some, the, the furnace was old and needs to be repaired. So maybe did you negotiate for an, a slight increase in price and they're going to replace the HVAC system? Well, amend that into your agreement and make sure that's getting taken care of. So after you have all of your agreements put together and you've done all your due diligence, done any amendments that you've needed, ask your questions, then you're going to want to start getting ready for closing. So again, take another look back through all your purchase agreements. Um, what are the deliverables and the um, covenants uh, that need to be met in order to get to closing? Some of this information might be in your financing documents. Um, reach out again to those lenders or the grant entities uh, to see what are they requiring. Do they have any specific lists in their documents? Do they want to see copies of the deeds? Do they want to see um, rent rolls of how many people would be um, either renting the, the spaces in the strip mall and how long those terms are for? Um, do we know that there's enough people that are going to be staying in the facility uh, to keep for the, for the entity to run it after it transfers? Um, so what are your financing obligations? Uh, do you have all of your um, contracts and assignments? Have, was there specific assignment agreements that needed to be drafted that identified you know, the contract for the rug cleaner, the contract for the... Um, the, the maintenance, outdoor maintenance person or land group crew is going to be coming with and have those been assigned and have those entities signed off. Um, look for these pieces when you're going to be preparing for closing and preparing your closing list. So you've got these on a chart and you can track. Um, look to how many documents do you need? Is everyone going to be signing together? Um, is anyone going to be signing early? Can you have multiple signature pages? Uh, and who's going to be coordinating this? Is the title company taking care of this? Is the tribe's lead attorney or the bank's attorney going to be taking care of this? And who's going to be present at these closings? Um, another thing, are there any internal agreements and resolutions? Um, perhaps the seller isn't as concerned that the tribe authorized uh, an appropriation of a million dollars from its general fund to its housing fund to purchase this, but you know maybe you want to make sure that that meeting happened. It was duly called, that the resolution was presented, enough people were there to vote on it and approve it, and that you've got the written resolution documented. Um, so, what other internal steps and procedures need to be done? Uh, that maybe aren't included in your transaction documents, but you're aware of um, to get this in place. And then just make sure that you've shared everything with the parties that are involved. So here's a sample of a closing, part of a closing checklist. Um, and I've got, you know, what were some of the, the internal actions that the tribe had to do to take up um, you know, did they have their charter approved, um, and did they ratify their charter? Did they get a resolution from the board of directors? Um, what's that resolution number? Do we have a copy of it? Who was working on it? What day was it done? Um, 
What about the contracts and the assignments? Um, were those signed off? Uh, where are we at on those projects? So, um, you know, organize. A lot of mine are kind of organized the same way with items, comments, status, where I can put my notes in. Did I send my draft off to other legal counsel and I'm waiting for their comments? Um, so manage some of those. And again, I think I mentioned this with closing or with contact lists, but if you need to have two where maybe there's a, a master closing checklist that all the parties are working off of that's not going to get into specific details, maybe it'll just say draft to seller on date, but maybe you then do you have your own internal that says, well, we sent our draft to the seller on this date, and because the key, issue, key issues were the lease, the lease terms and um, the building maintenance terms. And so, you know, your closing checklist can be another place to identify and manage the issues with the transaction. Um, so that might be a place that you want to have two different checklists, one for the external circulation and one maybe just for internal. And then another really key piece with your checklists is to give them version numbers and dates because you could be updating these, you know, multiple days, multiple times a day, and you don't want to get confused as to which one are you looking at. Um, so, you know, so there's, there's ways to put stamps, date and time stamps on your documents. Otherwise, um, you know, when you save them, because it version one, version two, are you giving it a new date? Um, but just be sure to track that. Um, it's also helpful, you know, when you're calling up that tribal council member and say, you know, hey, these are the things we have left. Pull up your closing checklist. Well, they might pull up their email and be looking at closing checklist version 6, and you're looking at version 8, and you guys have completely different information. So um, that's just a, a key way to keep other people organized, too. Um, so here's another part of the closing checklist. So for closing documents, uh, kind of same thing, you know, identify what all the documents are needed as deliverables to close the deal. Um, if you're working with the title company, they will be helpful as well and ask for um, and be tracking some of this information. But, you know, identify what all your documents are, where it's at, is it a draft to someone, has someone signed off on it, um, which party, and then include dates. So then the closing checklist also can be helpful with when you go to closing. Um, as you're sitting there with your client, then you can, on your what to do and that during that meeting, you can just go right down the list. Like, okay, we need our resolution. Here I present this resolution to you. And so then the board can talk about that, approve it. Then you move on to the next thing. This is what we're doing, the next piece of what we need to do. And you want to kind of look at the order too. You don't want to authorize the transfer of the funds before you've authorized creating the bank account. Um, you, know, you might be kind of, maybe I'm splitting hairs there, but I just like to feel like there's a flow that makes sense uh, in my meetings so that we all kind of are on the same page and we're building it in our mind and on, our pa on the paper as we go through the transaction. So, you know, did we get our resolution approving the agreements? Well, then let's sign the agreements. Then maybe we need to talk about approving the money to go well, then let's transfer the money. Um, and so you can kind of manage that through your closing checklist and just walk through it. Um, so then same with your closing documents. As you have them all there, you've got your easy created agenda, uh, and your tribal council will probably be happy that you've organized everything. So then for post-closing, there may be settlement proration issues that need to be settled up afterwards. Um, and whether that's going to be two weeks later, a month later, you know, depending on what your transaction is, maybe it needs to be 45 days. But schedule that date and then, you know, come back a couple more days to give yourself some more notice so that you're watching for that and prepared from that closing deadline comes. Um, also, were there documents that are recorded? you want to put on your calendar 
you know, what day you can expect for those recorded copies to come back so you can watch for them. If something happens and they don't show up, you've got on your calendar to remind you like, oh, where did those go? We, we should have had those by now. Was there a problem with recording? Um, you know, and utility charges, if you're transferring uh, property back and forth, did all the utilities get transferred over? Uh, did it actually take a few days after closing? And so are you going to owe the seller some money for what they covered for prorations for utilities for those days? Um, and then did you get all of your final policies and documents? Do you have all your final signature sets? Um, you can look back through your closing checklist and your due diligence checklist and, and see and compare. Well, put everything together um, to verify that you have every, all the deliverables that you were required to obtain and you know, organize them in your book. Um, then also look at were there any indemnity periods, um, any post-closing claim periods, um, and calendar those. Uh, did you have the opportunity to identify um, after closing, was there like a warranty on some repair work within six months that you know the, the pipes were fixed and they're not going to leak again? And oh, three months into it, the pipes were leaking. So yes, that's still covered under the warranty. You can go back to the seller. Um, but calendar that date so you know that's when that warranty will expire. Um, do you have a two-year indemnity period for any contracts and claims? Did um, did a material man or a supplier come back and say, hey, I never got paid on this and try and file a claim against you because you're the new buyer, a new owner? Well, you need to kick that back to the old seller um, and it's within that time period, so uh, it's much easier to do that. So take a look through the documents. What are those deadlines? And create another post-closing checklist. Um, so that's kind of a idea of a lot of the things to look at. Um, I have a couple full checklists I can pull up to show you. I have a Mac, so this is a little different. There we go. So this is what a sample, I'm pulling up a sample due diligence request list. Um, we started out with, you know, just kind of general information, identifying who the parties were, uh, what type of property was involved, and define the property. We have a, a paragraph in there that this is new where we don't know, as the buyer, we don't know what's going on with this whole project, and so we might have additional questions. So we're reserving the right to ask more questions as we and request more documents as we work on this. But, you know, going through and identifying um, what are the title documents that we're looking for, preliminary title reports, surveys identifying encroachments, locations of improvements and easements, um, as-built architectural plans, title policies, inventory of all equipment, um, list of automobiles, list of financing statements, um, and then, you know, the documents related to the seller that we wanted. Um, their articles of organization, a certificate of good standing in the state that the property is located, um, the, a management agreement with the other entity that was uh, managing the property and owned some of the equipment. We wanted to see a copy of that document. Um, articles for the other entities. Um, then leases, all space leases, license, sublicense, golf carts leases, equipment. Purchase orders. Permits, license, and consents. Do they have a license to, to sell liquor, a license to apply um, chemicals and pesticides? Um, license for to operate heavy machinery uh, are those going to be transferable um, license to operate and do food and beverage sales um, you know you want to take a look at those and make sure that they're valid 
Um, and so put those in your quest. And then also, did they receive any government notifications? Um, have there been any um, claims or requests for improvements? Um, financial and tax matters? Looked at audited financial statements? Budgets? Requests to speak with their accounting? Okay, I don't know why I keep doing this. Real estate documents. Um, litigation. Is there any litigation affecting the property? Is there any current claims? We asked about that. Any prior claims? Have they been settled? Give us all the information. Um, just because it's a settled claim doesn't mean it can't still... Something could always come up you want to be aware of. Um, Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're gonna, I'm going to talk later about the the Big Fish Golf Course project and um, how to avoid sand traps. And there was a lot of sand traps in that project. Um, but then other mis miscellaneous information. So it's kind of an idea of what a um, a due diligence request would look like. Um, and then the sellers were able to identify, like, oh, Article 3, Question 5, A, B, and C. Here's your answers. Um, and then closing checklist, where I, I usually put my contact list at the top of each of my checklists just because it's all together there and easy to, to reach the people, um, to know who everyone is. Um, also, if you do something like I did, and in the middle of these transactions, you switch law firms, um, it was easy to update my documents and to let everyone know. And um, then, you know, because that could, if you're working on a deal for quite some time, several months, and one of the key people suddenly leaves, it can cause some panic. But you can also manage that by knowing what's going to happen in the future, how is this going to go forward. Um, and so, you know, I made sure I let the client know um, I'm going to be sending out a contact, updated contact list so that they don't try and email me next week and get a bounce back that I'm not at the firm anymore. But they're going to get a contact that says I work somewhere else. And they're going to wonder, am I still involved with this project? So client, you need to be ready to answer that question. So again, here's, you know, we set up the tribe's actions. Um, and then I had another section broken down with what our new corporate board had to do, um, pointing their officers and bylaws and the resolutions, um, assignment documents and authorizations they had to make, and then the closing documents, and then some post-closing items. And then... You know, just a sample closing. This was an old version I had because um, we amended our, this project, we amended it and extended the closing date several times. But, you know, looking at your dates, highlighting anything um, that stands out. When we were working on this at one point, we realized that uh, our dates weren't aligning with how we selected. Um, we, you know, we picked a calendar day, date certain, as a closing date, and then we said, Within so many days of the preliminary title report, you have to give notice of um, any uh, exceptions, disapproved exceptions, their opportunity to cure those disapproved exceptions or reject those. Well, then when we started calendaring it out, we realized, oh, we don't have enough days in our till our closing period to get all these things in, in place. So we had to amend our days. But by actually doing the exercise of walking through, we were able to see that. Um, is there any questions? Yes. Are we be able to get a copy of your presentation later? Um, yes, I will send it out to NTLA, and um, I think they will be, they'll probably email it out to everyone or put it up in um, on one of their files. But um, you can also, if you've got a business card, you can um, give me an email, and I can send email it out to you. Any other questions? Yes. 
my other question, I just wanted to let everyone know I do checklists like that in Excel. And so you can set up rules in Excel so when dates come close, that the cell will turn, turn color. So if you want, like, so what I do, uh, anything that's coming up within two weeks, the cells turn red. If it's a month out, then they turn yellow. Um, if it's two months out, they're green. So then I can see immediately when I open the document, those cells refresh. What are the things that are coming up most uh, currently? Yeah, that's a really good tip. Um, did everyone hear that? Uh, and maybe for the recording that um, using Excel spreadsheets and putting rules in there so that the cells will highlight uh, things in certain colors. Green if it's still two months out, yellow if it's uh, one month out, red if it's one week out, so that when you open this, the sheet you'll quickly see where things need to go. Um, and I don't know if it showed up on the first ones I pulled up, but um, one thing I do in mind is after something's been um, completed, I will highlight it gray uh, so that it doesn't catch your eye as much, and then I know that that item has been done so that only the white items are um, standing out at me. But yeah, color coding is another good way to organize your spreadsheets. And if you could get it to scream at me, that would be better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe calendar somebody else's. Uh... It's a day away. Do it now, idiot. <laughs> All right. Well, if anyone has any other questions, I'll um, be around for a little bit, but thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your conference.